I'm joined now by Stefan Kinsella. He is a Houston area patent attorney and also a very well known libertarian theorist, a leading anti IP proponent. Stefan, thanks for joining me. How are you? Hey, Albert, I'm doing well. Um, I'm in fine fettle, as some people might say. Uh, you're coming out with a, a new blog post uh, that you've been working on, and uh, this apparently uh, has to do with your views on IP. I'm very looking forward to getting into it with you. But before we start, I just want to ask you, what, how would you describe um, the nature of, these, of this post? Is it uh, something that is revolutionary, uh, divergence from your original stream of thought, or is it a uh, kind of a clarifying uh, post? It's just clarifying. I think, um, you know, over the years, as I've struggled to um, come to grips with intellectual property and how it relates to property theory and to gain a deeper understanding of it, I mean, a lot of the insights I've had and that I, I, I uh, the way I think about property law seem fairly trivial and simple after the fact. And uh, maybe, maybe they are, but sometimes you circle back to something simple. Um, I've experienced in interminable debates since uh, I started loudly proclaiming my opposition to IP law in like 1995. Um, I've had so many debates with people and had so many experiences arguing the same things over and over and over and over and over again. And I've gradually seen um, ways of describing property rights, purpose of libertarianism, um, uh, the nature of IP and things like that, um, which have re caused me to reformulate some of my arguments and the way I present them. So, for example, um, in my in my uh, little monograph in 1998, 99, 2000 against intellectual property, which I still stand by pretty much everything in it, I'd probably tweak it a little now and I'd add some things to it. But I, it didn't occur to me to frame some of the arguments like I would now. I've come up with other ways of framing it that make more sense to me and that also seem to appeal to other people. And so what I was posting about on Facebook the other day, which you and a few other people picked up on, was like I have another – I had like another insight. And a lot of these insights seem really trivial and people make fun of them. But to me, that's how I make incremental progress. Uh, it had to do with Bitcoin, okay? Um, in a sense, the, the advent of digital technology, right? Basically, the emergence of the internet in 1995-ish um, – and the advent of piracy and wide, widespread digital file copying and all these things sort of caused a, a need for people to revisit their previous assumptions about property rights and intellectual property law, copyright and patent, because up until then, it wasn't a big issue, and it only affected the material realm. But now we have the internet, which is the world's biggest copying machine, and people can copy left and right. And people that are used to saying that ideas are property are going to start calling that theft or piracy, and the government's going to crack down on it, and people are going to fight it. And then libertarians are sort of caught in the middle because they sort of sense that there's really nothing wrong with learning things and copying and you know what we call competition on the free market, <laughs> which requires emulating, seeing what other people are doing and emulating it. Um, and yet that runs afoul of our previous sort of uh, background notions of, of property rights, that you have a property right and ideas. So the intellectual property or the, or the internet, the digital revolution required a rethinking or revisiting, I would say, of the foundations of property theory, which libertarians have done. And my impression, which is probably biased, is that by and large most clear-thinking uh, principled libertarians today are extremely knowledgeable about the flaws of the IP mentality, and they're against it. So the um, the digital revolution caused or required a rethinking of um, of intellectual property. And then there's different ways you can explain the problems with it. Right? You can look at the consequences. You can point to the history, the original purposes of it. Uh, you can point to the fact that it's largely a creature of state legislation, and you can point to problems with the state itself and legislation. So there's different ways you can approach that problem. Um, and the purpose of what I'm talking about here is not really about IP, although it stimulates that thought. It had to do with Bitcoin. So when Bitcoin emerged, Bitcoin was a, a, like another event, like the advent of digital technology. Bitcoin has required a lot of Austrians and libertarians to – sort of step back and rethink some of their foundational premises about the nature of money, the nature of property, and uh, even intellectual property and things like that, contract theory. Um, so – why? Unlike, can I interrupt for a second, Stefan? Sure, sure. Uh, why, why, would, uh, why would you say that about Bitcoin and not, 
for instance, some of the digital advancements that that preceded it. Bitcoin is unique in the sense that it's that it's competing in the monetary realm. But we've had other digital advances that uh, facilitated, you know, widespread copying and, and and things like that. What? Why do you think Bitcoin is is special in the sense that it makes us think about our ideas a little bit more carefully? Well, so yeah, so just the. Just having the internet itself and having the ability to copy information, right? Digital, the digitization of information, um, caused this sort of uh, uh, this this prospect of widespread, easily available dissemination of information. Just copying information itself, which threatened the existing patent and copyright model, especially copyright. So that's why that caused that. Um, all the other, all the other business models that were built upon the internet, I think, uh, didn't really add anything new as a theoretical challenge. Um, it was already there with the copyright um, problems. That you know, basically, there's a clash between the copyright interests, people that want to keep information contained, and people that are in favor of technology and the internet and digital information. There's obviously a conflict there, and that had to come to a head. And then libertarians, because we focus on ideas and principles, try to sort this out, try to figure out what the right side to be on is, et cetera. I think that battle has been won. I think we're, we're cleaning up right now. There's a few stragglers, and I think that's a great thing. Um, left libertarians, anarchist libertarians, Rothbardian libertarians, principled libertarians, um, libertarians suspicious of legislation and the state, they're all pretty much against IP. Which is a fantastic thing. Um, so I think that battle's been won. We're we're mopping up right now. That we have a few straggling Randians, which are kind of dying out anyway. Uh, we had a few uh, empirical minarchists who give a half-hearted, half defense of IP, like Richard Epstein and David Friedman. Sort of Adam Mossoff is doing his best as a, an objectivist law professor to try to uh, fix Ayn Rand's flawed view of, of copyright, but no one really <laughs> thinks this is going anywhere. Um, they've they've lost and they know it, and we're we're mopping up at this point. But when Bitcoin emerged, the the thing is, libertarians are enthusiastic about Bitcoin. They've never been enthusiastic about the state's ability to stop copying of information, right? They were uneasy about that. That's what caused this sort of big debate. Um, so in libertarians and especially the radical libertarians have been enthusiastic about Bitcoin. Um, and I think the first thing that happened was Bitcoin is like a new type of currency or money or whatever you want to call it or classify it as. And it really was not easy to be handled according to this traditional Austrian or free market view of money because you know we've been analyzing the way money really did emerge in the world, which is through physical scarce commodities like gold or silver or other, other commodities. And so the economic theories that were built up around it were centered on that. You know, I don't think Mises and his theory of money and credit could have imagined a digital currency like we have now or whatever you want to call Bitcoin. So when it emerged, it sort of caused – or it, it made it necessary for people who want to think about this in principal terms and clear Austrian terms to revisit Austrian theory. What about Mises' regression theorem? How does that apply to this? Does money really have to be a commodity? Was Mises trying to prove by his regression theorem that only a commodity could be money? And if he did, was he right? And can Bitcoin be money or not? And even if you know theorists say that it can't be money, you look around and it looks like people are using it as something like a money. So we have to explain that phenomenon. So that caused a um, maybe a doubt or a need to to revisit Austrian theory. Now that's economics. In terms of libertarianism, libertarians, especially a lot of the Rothbardians. Um, have opposed fractional reserve banking as a po- as a, in addition to fiat, you know, money, the, the Federal Reserve type money, government money, for various reasons on normative or political or rights based grounds. And I agree with all those. So then the question becomes, what is this? What is this new Bitcoin thing? How do we handle that normatively? So we came to a point. I won't say a crisis, but a point where. This Bitcoin thing doesn't look like it's going away. We need to find a way to analytically handle it. We need to understand it economically and hopefully within Austrian economics and and normatively. So you have all these proponents of Bitcoin in the libertarian and quasi-Austrian sphere, and yet everyone is talking about this new phenomena with a vocabulary that's widely – I mean it's very – it's all over the place. Some people call them coins. Some people call it a currency. You know, Some people call it digital money. Um, whatever. So, what do you question, call it? So, well, 
and, and this gives rise to why I started writing about it because I'm thinking from the from the proprietarian and intellectual property mindset and when I hear people say that you own your Bitcoin, okay, they make these statements, you own your Bitcoin. Now, I believe, as Mises did, he, he's got a great chapter or so on this in Socialism where he talks about ownership of de jure ownership and de facto ownership. He doesn't really go into this actually in human action. I'm not sure why he didn't carry it over, but it's a great discussion. It distinguishes between in the world of human action um, resources or things that we do in the world that are say de facto, that are real, things that we can use to accomplish things, and then the oughts or the shoulds or the norms, things that, that legal rights protect. So he makes a distinction between, say, legal rights and, I guess, uh, natural rights, right, or, or rights, or oughts that people should have. Or the, the situation faced by Robinson Crusoe on a desert island, he's got a series of means at his disposal. He can do certain things with it. But in, when society enters the picture and other people enter the picture um, – then we start talking about what you should do, what the law should be, who should be able to control these things. So there's a distinction. So there's a distinction between um, um, actual ownership in a sense, which is what most people I think think of to be honest. So when you have your typical Bitcoin enthusiast saying, I own this Bitcoin, they're not speaking like a lawyer would, like I would, right, or even like a careful political theorist would. They don't mean that there's a legally recognized right to own that Bitcoin. In fact, they never carefully define what the Bitcoin is, which is part of the problem, So, which I was grappling with. What they mean is this is a workable system, and I have the practical ability to change that ledger entry in Bitcoin. Right? Bitcoin – so Bitcoin to me is a, is a distributed ledger. It's a ledger distributed across – uh, a bunch of um, decentralized servers around the world with a certain protocol, a certain set of rules for people that want to participate in that scheme or that game or that ledger system. So a Bitcoin is just a way that we describe metaphorically the way that this system works. We can use the, the metaphor a Bitcoin to refer to one entry in a series of units right, which are defined by the scheme. So it's basically one of a unique number of finite entries in this in this ledger scheme, and the ledger scheme is maintained in identical copies of the blockchain stored on many people's computers around the world. So that's a fine way to use metaphors to understand the way a system works. But then people start thinking of, of the Bitcoin as a thing that can be owned. Now, when I hear the word ownership as a lawyer and as a libertarian – I think of legal ownership. The, that means the right to control. It doesn't mean the practical ability to control. It means the right to control. In fact, those things are separate. In, in the law, we distinguish possession from ownership. Possession is, in a sense, the, the practical ability to use a thing. Ownership is the legally recognized right to use a thing, and they can be different. So, for example, if you own a car, you have both the practical ability to use it and you have the legally recognized right to use it. But if someone steals the car from you, for that period of time when you don't have the car, someone else has the possession of the car, and you have the ownership of it still. It doesn't do you much good unless that claim of ownership could result in you reca recapturing your car or getting a payment, a restitution for it. So analytically, we have to distinguish these things. Okay. So when I hear a Bitcoin enthusiast say, I own my Bitcoin, I, I was prone to say, well, no, you don't own the Bitcoin. And they take that as an insult or as a criticism of the system. They think I'm being a, a Bitcoin detractor, and I'm not. I'm actually a Bitcoin proponent. I think it's an amazing system, and it emulates – it's designed as a system to emulate features of property rights. Just like if you play the game Monopoly, you know, there's a finite amount of fake dollars there. They're designed to make the game work according to the ways people want to play it. But it doesn't mean they're really dollars. It doesn't mean they're really money. It's just the rules of an internal system that people have adopted and agreed to participate in for their own benefit. I'm not disparaging it all by saying that. That is just the truth. But as a lawyer and as a libertarian, look, there's a saying in the law that a right without a remedy is hollow, which means it's not really a right. In other words, if all you can do is say I have a right, I have a right to have angels watch over me or something like that. But it doesn't – it's just a saying. It doesn't amount to anything. 
it's really not a real right. A real right is something that's legitimately and practically enforceable in a given social system, right? A given society. It has an effect. It has a consequence. Um, and therefore, when someone says, I have a right to something as a lawyer, as a libertarian, I think, well, okay, if, if you say you own Bitcoin number 212, what does that mean in actual legal terms? If you have an ownership of that Bitcoin, what that means is you could go to a court, even in a private society, and they could issue a ruling saying you own this Bitcoin instead of no person number C. But who would the ruling be issued against? Let's say C is long gone. Someone stole your password, and they used that password or your encryption key to transfer 100 of your Bitcoins in your account to someone else to pay for something. Let's say because someone else is now C. Person C is an innocent person who is selling widgets on Amazon. You paid him. The thief, the so-called thief, stole my Bitcoins and paid um, for this item from person C using my Bitcoins. Now, if I get a ruling from a court saying I own the Bitcoins, well, I guess that means C is in possession of my stolen Bitcoins. Similar to a case where if I own a watch and someone steals it from me and sells it at a pawn shop… And person C ends up buying it, even if the thief is long gone, right? Uh, theoretically, under regular property law, if I find the person C who bought the watch, even if he's a good faith buyer, he didn't mean any harm, I can get my watch back because of property rights. I own the watch. My ownership never ceased. I still own the watch. I can get it back. If you say Bitcoin is ownable, the same situation would have to apply. There would have to be a legal mechanism where someone makes some kind of order or a decree or a declaration saying, I own that Bitcoin. Now, what does that mean? If Bitcoin is just an entry in a distributed ledger, a ledger that's distributed and kept in information across many people's computers, well, what does that mean that some random person in Bangladesh who has a copy of the blockchain now has an obligation to open up his computer? And make an entry change in the way his magnetic hard drives are pointing information around? Do you follow me? So this is the problem. So to my mind, owning, owning a Bitcoin is analogous or similar or basically identical to owning reputation rights, which Rothbard criticized in The Ethics of Liberty. If you own a reputation right, it means you have a property right in other people's brains because your reputation is what people think about you. So if you have a property right in your reputation, that means you have a right to force people to change their minds, right? If you have a property right in a Bitcoin, you have a you have the right to use force to force people to change their Bitcoin uh, blockchain entries on their own servers. And I don't see how you get that right. This is the problem. There is no contract. See, this is the point. The distinction between uh, your 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 bank account at Chase Bank down the street. Or your, or your website account with GoDaddy, you have contracts with all these people. If someone uses your password to infiltrate your account, they're, they're actually committing trespass because they're using someone's property without their consent. They're using the bank's property without their consent or they're using GoDaddy's servers without their consent or they're using whatever I own, my money, in the bank without my consent. Okay, Just like if I leave my door open on accident to my house or unlocked, it doesn't mean that someone who – Walks into my house just because they can, right? Just because the door's unlocked doesn't mean they have a property right to use my house or to take things from my house. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you have the right to. It depends upon the consent of the owner. But all this presupposes the owner is an owner of something uh, that they own, right? Like Chase Bank owns its bank facilities and its servers, GoDaddy owns its physical servers, and, and so on. Bitcoin, as I understand it, is set up on purpose to be a quasi or pseudo anonymous system where there are no contracts required. There's no terms of a service that you have to click on. I agree to the following in order to make a transaction. It's just a scheme that some people are following, and the scheme determines who owns or who has the right to control a given Bitcoin entry in that ledger. And if someone steals or even guesses my password and they use that to enter that data into the bit blockchain network and causes all these thousands of people around the world to agree to change and update their pointers and their system at the same time or roughly the same time, then they're doing that voluntarily and I don't have the right to make them undo that, which would be the implication of me owning Bitcoin. Bitcoin. 
So this is actually all background, to be honest, um, Albert, to why the, the issue came up of how do you explain this and where the real dilemma is. So in a way, everything I've said so far is kind of background on what um, I really wanted to get to. 